All right, people are coming in. Okay, this is awesome. Uh, the room is filling up, um, so that's really exciting. Um, again, hi everybody. My name is Jacqueline and I am one of the co-hosts for this event. And it's been an incredible experience and I've been so honored to be here with all of you. Um, so I'm excited for, for my, last, my last session and I am honored to be in company with these lovely ladies. Um, so, this is a session that's all about participation in HD research. Um, and so we've got Lauren who is going to host or co-host and she is going to be joined by panelists, Nicole from Canada, Jenna from Canada and Heather from the UK. Um, so without further ado, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Great. Hi everybody, um, it's a privilege as always to um, be speaking um, at this event. I've been blown away. Um, I'm super proud of the HDO team um, for everything that we've achieved and the information that's being shared this weekend. Um, I hope everyone's having a great time. Um, I'm just gonna start off by saying this is gonna, I'm gonna try and keep this as interactive as possible, as much as possible. And, Please, please ask questions. Um, uh, this is about getting the information that you want to hear um, and getting um, from the experiences that myself and the panel panelists have. A little bit about me, I'm Lauren Byrne. I am a PhD researcher and family member. Um, so I work at the UCL, UCL Huntington's Disease Centre um, with Ed Wilde and Sarah Freezy. Um, so I have kind of multiple hats um, in this idea of HD research and I have the understanding of what it's like to do HD research, but also I've participated in quite a few of the HD research studies um, and um, yeah, have that passion of why it's important. Um, where I'm hoping that we can get out of this or you all can have an understanding of why we why should you take part in, in HD research and why is it important. Um, so I've put together a few slides at the start to kind of get us into the idea of research and what that kind of involves. And then I'm going to go straight into introducing our panelists and they're going to give you a bit of their own experience of taking part. And then um, we will have a good 30 minutes um, of Q&A. So really, this is about what we can we can share with you and what you want to hear. So I think a big obvious um, aspect of doing Huntington's disease research is our real hope that we can develop a treatment or a disease modifying drug or cure, whatever way you want to think about it. But I think that's the most obvious um, aspect of Huntington's disease research is to try and improve our, our futures and, um, and the futures of our family members that are impacted. Um, I wanted to highlight kind of the legacy of HG research, which I find really um, um, moving when I joined the Huntington's research field as a researcher. Coming from a family, it was a beautiful thing to, to understand how collaborative the Huntington's disease research field is. Um, and that goes right back from the discovery of the gene back in 1993, which was led by Nancy Wexler. And we, um, I'm sure a lot of people attended um, her sister's talk at the start of the conference. Um, but that was a real collaborative effort with um, thousands of family members taking part with, um, across the globe and participating. And that is the reason why we were able to find the gene and find the cause of Huntington's disease that has led us on the path of, of very exciting research and, and hopeful, um, hope for therapies that we have at the moment. And I'm sure some people have heard Huntington's being described as the most curable and curable brain disease before, because unlike some other diseases um, like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, which are primarily um, don't have a cause or a genetic cause. Um, 
we know exactly what causes Huntington's disease in every person that gets it, which gives us a real head start for um, understanding what's happening um, and really looking further to, to develop drugs and therapies. So one thing I wanted to highlight that is the difference in observational research versus um, a clinical trial, because I think sometimes you um, uh, the word clinical trial gets used in the context of observational research, so it's important to differentiate. Um, and really, observational research is um, observing people that have Huntington's disease or have the gene that um, will or they are pre-manifest but carry the gene for Huntington's disease, and comparing what's different in those and observing what's different in in those people versus someone who doesn't. Um, or what we call healthy controls. Um, and that will go in a bit further of what ways we can observe people, but that's really what you're looking at. We're taking a magnifying glass and trying to understand what is going on. Um, and that is in hopes of then having future targets and potential treatments that we can test in a clinical trial. So when we think of a trial, um, it, you can think of it in a similar sense of a, a a trial in the court where you're trying to put the evidence together to to defend or um, um or take down a claim of something that happened so when you're we're doing clinical trials we're doing that for a drug to to show if the claim that this drug will modify Huntington's disease is actually true so that's the main difference and then when we think of observational research, there has been a ton since the discovery of the gene back in 93. And we're, we're very lucky in the Huntington's disease field to have such a rich um, amount of observational studies and data um, that has really kind of set us apart from other diseases, particularly for how rare a disease Huntington's is. And that really comes down to the, the not only the researchers, but very much the family members that are so willing to partake and, and get involved. So the kind of things that we do when we're, when you come to do research might be anything from a rating scale or assessment with the clinician. Um, I, you might have a doctor um, make you do kind of finger tapping or check your walking. Um, and that's to look at kind of motor symptoms. There might be thinking tests, or um, they might ask you questions about your daily life and your ability to you know, do your day-to-day -day activities. Um, and these are all fine, but I, I wanted to highlight where a lot of research and observational research is heading at the moment, which is particularly important to young people and impacted by Huntington's. These reading skills and clinical skills are really useful for the manifest disease. So when people have overt symptoms that can be characterized with them, but they're not so useful for anything before that when people are look very healthy and, and can do everything. But, um, and if we want to treat Huntington's disease, I really think that the best hope we have is, is treating early. Um, before people ever get the disease and symptoms itself. So to do this, we need to develop new tools. And that's what a lot of the research going on now with um, in observational research is focused on looking at people far from what we would say their predicted onset of symptoms is based on their mutation. Um, and you might hear things about biomarkers, um, which is one of the potential outcomes of do, running an observational study is that we're trying to observe people and the changes that we might observe would be these biomarkers that could potentially be used in, in many ways to improve drug development and disease monitor, monitoring. Um, so observational clinical research could be doing an MRI scan to get images and pictures of the brain that can tell us a whole lot of things that is going on inside as we know that Huntington's disease is a brain disease. Most of the pathology and things that are happening are happening in the brain. And it could be blood tests, it could be thinking tests, um, it could be lumbar punctures. Um, 
biofluids are becoming particularly important for important source for uh, biomarkers. Um, and it could be anything from saliva, urine, blood, or CSF, which has been mentioned a few times. Sarah Tabrizi uh, did an excellent introduction to what it's like to take part in the Ross trial um, and mentioned the intrafecal injections and lumbar punctures. Um, so I wanted to highlight a, a study, PhD Yaz, which is actually led by Sarah Tabrizi, um, the young adult study. Um, and that was one study that took um, people that were very far from onset that carried the Huntington gene um, that were 18 to 40 and compared them to people that didn't um, that were around the same age. Um, and they did this very in-depth um, study where they did MRI scans, intense um, cognitive and thinking tests. And it was a whole day and a half of uh, assessments to try and really really observe Huntington's as far far back from to see if they could detect the earliest of changes and this is kind of going back to the idea of prevention medicine that I mentioned in the hopes that if we um we can change the course of what is happening where we see that in a normal um if someone didn't get a treatment that has the Huntington genes they would start the neurons would start to get sick um, and um, eventually die and that's what leads to Huntington's but potentially we could treat um, after we know someone tested positive um, predictively and then in the hopes that that would extend or improve the life of the, the brain cells and the neurons and subsequently um, avoid the onset of disease or delay the onset of disease. So to some of those findings, this is a very scary figure and it looks, um, it's hard to make any sense of it, but really what that figure is saying is that there were no um, cognitive, which is another word for thinking or um, and psychiatric changes. So people that were that far from onset and carried the Huntington gene um, were no different from other, um, what we would say healthy controls were. Um, but they did find, um, and they find no um, real differences in brain, but they were able to find some early changes in a, a biofluid biomarker called neurofilament light. So this is going to be potentially super important for um, designing in therapies or designing trials in people that don't have symptoms of Huntington's disease. Um, Another thing I wanted to touch on is what we would, what um, people think about when we they hear about new therapies and tr clinical trials, um, and it's slightly a caveat. And I just want people um, in the community to have realistic views of what, what when a scientist is getting excited about a trial and a drug that um, that what that translates to might not be what uh, the family members feel. So we can have different types of treatments um, that have different effects. So the only treatment that's been approved for Huntington's is, um, is uh, uh, tetrabenazine, which is a symptomatic treatment. So it helps with the movement disorder, the chorea, but it doesn't change the effect of disease. So you can see someone can get the, the symptomatic treatment and, and have some symptom relief, but their course of disease doesn't change. You can have a drug that could slow progression, and that just means that it, it'll take it, it won't, um, they'll still get worse, but at a slower rate than, than people that don't get the treatment. You can have a, a treatment that stops progression, which means that someone kind of stays at the, the state that they were when they start taking the treatment. And then the real, you know, what we'd love to have is something that could reverse disease. Um, when we're thinking about the current Huntington lowering trials, I think what scientists are thinking about is a drug that might slow progression. And that's what they would, would um, mention is modifying drugs. So 
it's just something to bear in mind. And, um, I just wanted to say, and I won't talk about these. And go straight on to kind of what we can all do and get straight into our panelists' you know, um, experience. But I just wanted to mention that participating in research and being involved isn't necessarily just about actually actively do it, taking part. Um, it's important, I think, to keep informed and know what's happening in the community. And we have great resources like HD Buzz. Um, if you do want to take part in research, I think the first protocol would be Enroll HD. And a few of us have taken part in that and can talk about it after. HD Clarity is linked to um, Enroll HD, but it is a um, CSF and blood collection study, um, which is global. Um, so there's sites uh, around the world. Um, one that's particularly um, important to people in the US and that are from 8 to 30 age um, is this Change HD study, which will be taking part in, um, I think Iowa is the main site, but they have a few other sites. Um, and if you Google them, you can find out more. Um, and keep up to date on kind of the, trials and ongoing um, uh, the progress of, of, of clinical trials, which is often summarized in the clinical trials corner in the Journal of Huntington's Disease. And the HDSA have a, a wonderful resource of checking um, like where your closest trials and studies are going in the US. In the US. Um, so yes, getting straight to our panelists. Um, I can talk a bit about first my um, experience and the, the studies that I've taken part in, um, and then I'll pass over to each of our, our um, panelists, Jenna, Nicole, and Heather, to tell us a bit about the studies that they've taken part in and what it was like, and then we'll have a discussion. So I've taken part in um, Enroll HD, and I started back in 2014, and that was um, I think just after I tested negative uh, for Huntington's disease. So that's an important thing to know about enroll is that it's for everyone. Um, you do not, you just need to come from a Huntington's family. You don't need to be tested, um, but you can be tested and be po gene positive or negative to take part. Um, it's pretty, Asks about two hours, and they will ask you about your um, your day to day activities, how um, you get on with your day to day tasks. They'll take some bloods. They will do the neurological exam, and and the clinician will get you to walk the nose straight line and and finger tapping. Um, and there is also they'll ask you about your um, your mood and behavior um, and what medications and, and other health conditions that you might have. Um, I have also taken part in HDAS, the young adult study, which involved, um, it was quite an intense day of much more in-depth um, studies um, and assessments. Um, and it also involved the lumbar puncture. Um, which I think we cannot, a few of us have had a lumbar puncture and can maybe talk a bit more in, after um, about what that feels like in that experience. Um, and I've had quite a few MRI scans um, for various different studies and often helping out with um, some of the local studies at UCL um, get set up. Um, I think if I was in any other research. Anyway, I'm going to pass over first to Jenna to, to tell us a bit about her and her experience of, of taking part in research. Okay, hi. Um, uh, so as mentioned, my name is Jenna and um, I'm from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Jackie mentioned that earlier and like many of you listening, I come from a family that's um, impacted by HD. My mom is um, gene positive and seems to be progressing from uh, mid to late stages. Um, and I consider myself to be part of um, the sandwich generation as someone who's raising my own small kids. Um, 
while also providing a significant amount of um, care, giving support to my mom. Um, in addition to um, my caregiving responsibilities, I've, I've, I see myself as having an equally important role in um, patient advocacy and patient advocacy um, with regards to um, where uh, like patients might fit into um, providing advocacy for pharma and other regulatory bodies as the landscape of clinical trials is rapidly and changing and evolving. Um, so I have participated in um, uh, Enroll HD and um, HD Clarity um, as uh, control. And um, I've supported my mom who's participated in, in both of those studies as, um, as uh, someone that carries the gene. Um, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions about that. But something that I wanted to share is that um, there are various different ways to participate and um, in, in clinical, in, in research studies and in, in clinical trials um, and natural history studies. Currently, I'm a member of uh, HD COPE, which is a global coalition for uh, patient engagement. We're a coalition of just over 20 representatives from around the world who work with pharma and industry to provide the patient's voice um, in the development of um, observational studies, um, natural history studies and clinical trials. Um, and um, as you may have heard today, many of the pharmaceutical companies have partnered with patient advisory groups um, such as HD COPE to better understand and develop effective um, clinical trials and research studies. Um, over the last three years that I've been involved with HD COPE um, uh, and, and this sort of research, I've sat on many patient advisory boards with Roche and Wave and Unicure, Azavan, Triplet Therapeutics, Novartis, uh, many of these companies as a patient advisor. And so um, my point in sharing this is that um, there are many, many different ways to get involved. And, and right now it's such um, an, um, uh, an imperative time in the Huntington's community for people to get involved. And um, though I understand that clinical trials and even observational studies and nat natural history studies might not be for everyone, um, the average the avenues and opportunities to get involved in research in some capacity are widely available. And it's really, really important that, that people in the Huntington's community, especially um, are the, you know, the young people in the Huntington's community understand that as we've been seeing and learning, there are a range of options available from Enroll HD to HD Clarity, natural history studies through Roche and uh, triplet therapeutics. Um, and then, you know, the range of clinical trials um, that could be from, you know, having a simple, well, I shouldn't say simple, but having a, 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 an in, a blood infusion to intral fecal injections. And now what we're seeing with Unicure uh, injections directly into the brain. When I joined the HD community 10 years ago, these options uh, didn't really exist. And, um, you know, Enroll HD was just um, becoming a thing. And, and um, as I mentioned, I think it's, it's really important for young people to think about where they can get involved and what their, their level of comfort might be. Um, and to determine if they have a place um, in the landscape of HD research as a participant, um, as an advocate or as both. Um, um, at this point, there are so many entry points to be involved in these different uh, research studies and clinical trials. Um, uh, and then now even more so the opportunity to get involved as an advocate um, for the accessibility and availability of high cost drugs for rare diseases. Um, so I, I'm happy to answer any questions about my, uh, any specific questions about my participation in, in um, those trials, but also um, in my involvement in, in research um, as a patient advocate. That's amazing, Jenna. Um, and I think um, the HD COPE aspect is super important. And I think we should definitely talk more about um, advocacy and, and 
and kind of that side of things after. Um, shall I pass over to Nicole? Hey, okay. Um, I'm Nicole and I'm from Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. Um, I have grown up with HD my entire life. Um, my grandfather had HD uh, and he passed away before I was born. He, when he passed away, they actually sent his brain to Vancouver for HD research. And um, a couple of months later, my grandma got a letter in the mail saying that he actually didn't have Huntington's disease. And so my dad went and got his life insurance and then him and my mom decided to have kids after that. And then they had me and my sisters. And when I was four, my aunt had tested positive for Huntington's disease and was put into a nursing home. Um, so my parents told me right away. So there was something that I guess didn't happen or they didn't know the brain um, back then. So uh, yeah, when I was four, my one aunt had it and then like got diagnosed with it. And then when I was in high school, my next aunt got diagnosed with it. And my family grew up being like, hey, well, two out of three siblings have Huntington's disease. So they didn't think that um, my dad would have to worry because what are the odds that three out of three kids um, have Huntington's disease? So in 2016, my dad tested positive for Huntington's and my life kind of crashed. <laughs> Um, my dad is a very hard worker, very much a boomer. Um, so when he tested positive, he kind of denied it. Um, he was also an electrician, so he continued working. Um, about two years later, I tested positive for HD as well. So I do have the gene as well. Um, and then I started with HD and Roll. That was my first introduction to HD research. I felt like I needed to give back to the community um, because the community had already been such a big support for me. And I knew that whatever I could give to them in order to hopefully give me a better opportunity, um, I wanted to do. But also once I tested positive, I didn't want to talk about research at the same time because as much as people kept telling me, oh, like have hope, have hope, there's all this research, have hope. I literally wanted to tell everyone to shut up. Uh, sorry for my language, but that's how I felt because as a gene positive person, people are telling you to have hope, but at the end of the day, unless there was like a definitive answer, I didn't want to have that hope because I didn't want to get my hopes up for a life that I would be able to control the symptoms and stuff like that. Like, unless there was a way to completely get rid of it, like I didn't want to have that hope. So therefore at that time, talking about research wasn't good for me. Um, it wasn't health healthy for me to cope with. Um, and then a couple months later, I got my dad to switch doctors to my doctor, which I have Dr. Gutman, and he is amazing. Um, and Dr. Gutman met my dad, very first appointment, and was like, uh, you're not supposed to be working right now. Like, you're an electrician, you're symptomatic, electricity and possible falling off the ladder and all that, probably not a great idea. Um, my dad also did not tell his work that he had Huntington's disease. So um, the doctor gave him six months to tell his work or he was not going to be allowed to work. Um, so he ended up telling his work, but in that time, he was also told that he would be able to be a part of HD, like to be a part of the Roche study. And um, he was like, I won't do that. I don't want to take the time off work to go to these appointments. I have to take three days off every two months. Like, I don't want to do it. And I kind of pushed him. To do it. My dad also has a huge fear of needles, like a huge fear. He faints every time there's needles or blood like and he's like I number one don't want to take three days off work every two months and number two I'm not getting a needle in my back every two months not happening um after talking to his work and talking to my mom and talking to family members my dad actually agreed to do HD Roche um and he 
it's like amazing to see because we can tell when he gets the drug and when he doesn't get the drug because it's crazy to see like how good he is when he gets it and how horrible he's gone when he doesn't get it. Um, and then this year I was given the opportunity to do HD Clarity. And so I decided to take part in that because I was like, if I kind of encourage my dad to get a needle in his back, I also have a huge, huge phobia of needles. I'm like my dad, I pass out every single time. Um, we actually got, I got my HD Clarity spinal tap done on the same day um, as my dad getting his Roche drug. So we did that together on that day. But I feel like if my dad can do it every two months, the least I can do is do it once a year for him as well as for myself and for like everyone else in the community. So if anybody has questions, I'm willing to answer, but that's a little bit about me and like my experience I've done. So like I said, I've done HD uh, enroll and I've done uh, HD clarity. And then I've witnessed the whole Roche situation. Yeah. That's beautiful, Nicole, thank you. Um, and then finally, I have Heather to share, who I'm very lucky to work with um, at UCL, but uh, she's also in the HD family, so I will let her go ahead. Hi, so if you can't hear me, just stop me. The Wi-Fi might be dodgy. Also, my lights are flickering, so it could be a bit of a disco too, but uh, we'll see how we get on. Um, I think listening to everyone else's stories is really humbling for me because uh, I think my story maybe represents more like the caregiving side. So again, I did grow up with Huntington's disease in the family. Um, but for me, it was again, like Jenna, it was my granddad, but he died pre-symptomatic. So for us, um, it's a family of four. So uh, three boys and one girl and my auntie, the girl uh, presented with symptoms and um, I think my earliest memory is uh, um, just always having my dad go next door to my auntie's house to mind her. And I was, never knew why. And this was, I always, I know, don't remember her pre wheelchair. So it was always like, we, we never really knew what was wrong or could never understand the symptoms. And I think as a, like a young child and not really seeing many people who are unwell, it was strange that I think like that Samber situation, like, my dad was then minding my auntie. So I think as we grow up and um, I think a small village in Ireland, it's a very like typical story where my dad tested because he had had children. And my mom was like, we need to know. Um, but my two uncles didn't. And it's not really talked about, but my dad is gene negative. So therefore myself and my brother are also gene negative. But for my elder uncle, he, he never tested. so. I think it's, it's interesting the reason why you would and why you wouldn't. But for me, um, I think I'm just really nosy. And I didn't, because I'd never heard of Huntington's disease and didn't know anything about it or none of your friends know about it and no one talks about it that I was like, oh, but what is it? And like, why, why my auntie and not my dad or not me? Or um, why isn't it a common thing that people just talk about? Like we get the flu, so like, what's the difference? Um, so that was like my drive into research. So, um, and that's actually where I met Lauren. We did our masters together in neuroscience. And um, I really appreciate when Jenna said, um, oh, sorry, no, it was Nicole who said, uh, you didn't want to know about the research when you first found out. And I never would have appreciated that until you said it and actually explained that um, you don't want to know all that when you have to deal with the, the outcome yourself. And I think that's really important that you don't have to get into the research straight away. It's it's always going to be there and there's no time frame where you have to rush it. But I think you should only ever get into it if you want to, because otherwise it's a chore. And do we ever do our chores? Because I don't. So I think that's really important point there that is really good to highlight that. Um, I think from my side of being more the caregiving role and having it that way in my family, that this was how I thought I could do more because we, people wouldn't talk about it and people couldn't explain it. And there's, this might not come across, but in Ireland, if you see someone wobbling down the road, it's usually because they're drunk, not because they have a disease. So um, I think that was really important to highlight. I think I'd get very defensive if um, there was another, 
a woman in, in the village who had Huntington's disease, but again, not talked about because God forbid. Um, and you'd hear people being like, oh, walking down the street at like 1 p.m. drunk. And I just get really defensive because I'm like, you just don't know and you just can't assume these things. So that started my, my research journey. And again, like Lauren, um, I did a lot of observational research. So why um, the mutation affects people slightly differently or why people are onset a bit earlier than others. And it was pretty just to educate myself. And um, again, I think like Jenna, just to spread awareness. So um, I really enjoyed the research because I felt like I was giving back to the community. But also in turn, because my research was observational and really back in the lab, I wasn't really facing um, patients and I really missed that interaction with people or, you know, when you talk to someone, you don't have to explain it in such scientific terms and it's a waste that way. And how I used to get past that is I used to explain my science to my mommy and if she understood it, then we were great and then everyone else would too. So um, I really enjoyed that and I just really enjoyed talking about it as a casual conversation. It didn't need to be anything more. It was just so that people would know and have some answers. So through the research then, and I do work with uh, Sarah Tabrizi and I've loved it, um, but HDYO has given me this chance to be able to translate the research like on the education committee so that, you know, we can basically stretch it as far as it can go. And then just like hope people can hear like all different types of stories and like no one is an outsider in HDYO, like everyone listens and there is so much to learn and like research for me gave me that like that like that was the goal for me i was able to like directly know what i was doing and why and i've also participated in studies i think i've given my blood to everybody in the in the huntington's disease center at ucl they all have it um i've also done all the mris i fall asleep in them all so like when i was working and i needed a nap i was like does anybody need an mri done because i'm ready so I use that as a little nap um and I think a, an important thing to say is, and uh, Nicole, fair play, um, I am not one for needles either. And I was in the, the study where you had an optional lumbar puncture and I didn't do it. Um, I gave my blood and I did all the assessments and I did the MRIs. But the lumbar puncture for me, I was petrified. Um, and I think that's an important thing to say that you can give what you can give and there's no limit and there's no, there's no too little and there's no too much. Like it's important all the way. And um, for people, if that would be like an, to put them off, like it's okay, you, you just do what you can do at the time and that's enough. So that's, I suppose, my story into the research. And I think, I think I'll always be nosy. So I'll always want to know where we're at. And I think being with HGOIO is like the best, the best place for me to be for it. So that's me. Perfect. Thank you so much, guys. So. Um, I want to invite everybody to, or anybody who wants to ask questions to any of us, um, but I think I'll get the ball rolling and because a lot of things that each of you have said have really triggered kind of like, oh, we should discuss this more. Um, I wanted to get started on that. I might stop sharing my screen so we can see each other better. Um, one thing um, I think it is really important to start with, I think it's from Nicole and, and mentioning how she didn't want to hear about research earlier. And I completely relate to that. I come from a very large Huntington's family in Ireland and it's very much, yeah, a lot of people didn't want to know. I was, for me, I'm, I'm that's how I handle the unknown is like learn everything about it. And I kind of went to like, um, but that for me, gave me control. Um, and it's one of the, you know, I, I got tested um, when I was in undergrad university and a lot of it was inspired by people like Jeff Carroll and Charles Sabine who we'll hear about after this. Um, I was lucky to, to hear about those and that was so different from the story I had grown up with where um, it, it was like don't get tested you don't need to know there's no hope you know there's nothing you can do and and the sad thing is that that's still the case back in Ireland there's very little research going and they're not the access to drugs is not a thing um, and won't be a thing anytime soon. So it's something I'm pretty passionate about back at home and very frustrated with, but um, I can't, this is what I can do kind of over here and, and how I deal with, with it. But the rest of my family, my sister and mom, you know, they sometimes ask about my research and what I do and what's going on. But my sister's basically just tell me when there's a drug and, 
that's so everyone's different and everything is valid and, and right but um i think maybe there's a bit to be discussed of what benefits and how, what what has been great for people that have taken part like did it maybe one what was yeah the good sides of of interacting with research teams and things like that, maybe to start off with, if everybody has anything to add to that. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to start. I think maybe Nicole, having come from that perspective of not wanting to know about research, how did you find then the experience of then engage when you did engage? Um, I found it. So the very first, it was actually a month after, literally a month after I got my positive results because I had already booked the appointment while I was still at risk. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm going in there. I signed up for this. Yes, now I know I'm being positive going into this. Um, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to do what they need to do. And then I'm going to get out just because HD, enroll, like Enroll HD is very, like you said, they just do a bunch of like brain tests um, and have conversation and stuff like that. So it was very much, I was in that headspace. I'm deemed positive. I'm back in this office. Um, but the staff are amazing. Like there, I don't think I've ever gone in there and not felt welcomed. And now that my dad goes there every two months, they literally know my life story. They know I've gone back to school they know like that I've moved like they know my life story and you really build um like it just feels like at home when I'm walking in there like it yeah, doesn't I, feel uncomfortable it doesn't feel awkward it, I share that yeah. so much because when I went to UCL you know to get involved in history research I um uh had this real fear of like oh they're not really going to get it because any experience I had with a healthcare professional before that was of lack of knowledge and no understanding of the disease and, and what it was about. But when I went at least to the HD center um, at UCL, it was just incredible. And I've learned so much about the disease and, and how it affects people that it's, it's really benefited my understanding and of my dad and some other family members. Um, and then I've been able to give back in terms of I work. I also was a study coordinator for um, HDCSF, which was a local um, observational study. Um, and I got over. I got eighty people to have lumbar punctures multiple times. So um, you know, I, I have a lot of experience on that side of things, and and being present when I'm talking with family members going through research as much as I have with actually taking part myself. And it's just been a complete privilege to be able to kind of listen to them and hear them and, and have that the under, then feel the understanding from me um and yeah being able to share that and and give them a space where they're finally heard and understood and and don't have to kind of explain anything when they talk about their loved ones or the, the complexities that it is with, with dealing with Huntington's every day I think the other thing for me, because they typically, if you're doing positive, they'll try, if it's your doctor, they'll try and attach like your clinical to it. So at the end of every appointment, I have my clinical to go with it. And I'm like, okay, this is when he tells me I'm going to be symptomatic. Like, this is it. And every time he's like, Nicole, you are not symptomatic. You know, you're not symptomatic. Um, but there's always that fear when you're walking in that you're like, is this the appointment? Like, yeah, it's a research appointment, but is this the appointment that you're gonna be told that you're symptomatic? Yeah. And it's just, that is also a fight that you sometimes have mm -hmm. with yourself. I mean, I feel I, like, well, at least- I really I feel for that. Cause yeah, so many of the pre-manifest people that I work with are, you can feel the anxiety when you come into clinic and I feel it for them and, um, yeah, it's something I want to ask more about of like how you approach that to come into clinic. Um, do you think it's a big barrier that stops a lot of people who are uh, at risk or pre-manifest from taking part because they're afraid of being told that they are symptomatic? Um, I feel like it does impact some friends because um, we're very open and we have these conversations that it does impact them in a way. They're just 
like you're just afraid to find out the earliest that you can find out Mm -hmm. instead of kind of being in denial about it um like I said I do have that fight but at the end of the day I literally call my HD support like anyone that I've met through HDO anyone that I've met through iPad I will call them up to like a week or two before and be like hey I'm freaking out about this we talk it through and then it's fine and then on the way home I freaked out for nothing but then I have a dance party on my car for my two-hour drive home so (laughs) it's just yeah it it definitely is a freak out and it's anxiety but it's just making sure that like your support system knows like you're Mm -hmm. freaking out and it's okay to freak out yes what about you jenna um what have been kind of the most positives of um taking part in in new stage well, I think Nicole touched on something that is, that is important, and, and I think observational studies like um, Enroll HD, um, but even in, in many of the other clinical trials, is that relationship building piece. And I think, like, um, just like outside of the HD community, I've participated, I've become a part of other types of citizen panels and across the board, what I see when it comes to research studies and observe and clinical trials is that that relationship building is, is a key piece. And like Nicole mentioned, um, like Nicole mentioned, um, you know, like seeing people regularly, they, they know your story. Like, you know, my mom's team of doctors, we've been working with them now for like 10 years. And so um, just recently when my mom had some falls, like they were the first people I emailed to say, you know, she's had a major change in her status because um, there's just that uh, sense of, of, of community. So I think that relationship building is a really positive thing. Um, the other thing actually too, that um, uh, I think is interesting is, is the anxiety. So um, I'm a control and when I participate in Enroll HD, um, they're, uh, you know, like Enroll HD, they do all these like cognitive, st- these cognitive tests, like count backwards by nine, um, uh, starting at a hundred. And so, um, you know, like, even though um, I know that I don't carry the HD gene, it's funny how just participating in those cognitive assessments can impact you in the anxiety that I can create. Like before I go into my study, when I'm, when I'm driving there, Nicole, I'm like, okay, or maybe it's not nine, maybe it's seven. I can't remember. But anyways, I'm like, okay. I'm like, it's definitely I'm seven. Because I heard- count back yeah so because I participated in enroll HD like so many times I, I know what I know what to expect and and I'll like I'll like prep I'm like okay I just want to I want to beat it you know and so it, it's kind of fun and like even with the the research coordinator you know when you're like looking at the colors and you're red blue green red blue green you know I'm always like it's a race like I wanted I want to do better than before I try, I try to remember how well I did so um I think it's, it can be anxiety inducing anyway, you know, because I think, oh, am I just like having cognitive decline because I'm just aging or, you know, like what, what's happening? Um, you know, is, am I not eating properly? What's, what's going on? So I think, um, you know, building a relationship and being able to see those as like a, a positive, um, challenge is, is good. The other thing that I wanted to mention too, is that, um, when I participated in HD Clarity, I did it with my mom, Nicole, um, the same day as, as she did. Uh, I think you mentioned that with your dad. And I had so much anxiety going into um, the spinal tap because my mom has a lot of involuntary movements. And just as like a caregiver, I'm always worrying about her. I always put her first. And like, I was so concerned about how she would cope with it. And, um, our doctor, I went first and, and I was okay. Oh, actually we did it in tandem. Um, and, and the doctor said, oh, you're like, the doctor came and said to me, cause he was like, I guess, floating back and forth. He said, or one of the doctors was floating back and forth and he said, oh, your mom's doing great. Like she's already done. And, you know, I was kind of shocked cause I was so worried about her the whole time. Um, and then even, con- even after the study, like I was so worried about her. Okay, mom, you got to rest and sit down and da, 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 da. And, you know, she ended up being fine. And, and actually 
I had a post lumbar puncture headache and, and was laid up for about um, two days trying to get over the headache. And it was, it's just kind of interesting, like from the perspective of a caregiver, I was so worried about her and the impact that it would have on her. And she was fine. She was invited back for a yeah. second and went back again. And, and she, did I can add to that actually from what having lots of people take, seeing lots of participants have lumbar punctures and actually it's more likely get the post LP headache in younger and I think women as well um but that I think one of it because of I think lifestyle like when you're younger you're gonna you can't really sit and rest properly for a day or two after a lumbar puncture and you end up have children to look after or or um jobs to go back to um but there I think there is something as well about um Huntington's um patients especially if they're pretty manifest or sorry were moderate um, stages, I anecdotally would say that they don't experience pain in the same way or discomfort. Yeah. Um, and one thing that people don't know actually is if, when people are calm and go to sleep with functions, their movements um, drop. Um, but one thing as a person who assisted in, in lumbar punctures, sometimes it's better not having the loved one in the room because they can create more anxiety and more stress for the patient and the doctors. <laughs> so um, there's been times where certain um, care, caregivers are like fantastic at keeping their partner calm. And, um, and other times you're like, I think we should go to get a coffee um, and then it's all fine um, because the nurses and um, are very good at getting people to like distracted from what was happening. Um, and, I like know everybody who took part in HCCSS full story and the names of the children and everything because I would just talk to them like constantly to, to distract them from what was happening. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on actually with lumbar punctures versus um, blood tests, um, particularly for people who are needle phobic. Um, the nice thing about lumbar punctures, you don't see the needle and you don't really know what's happening. So it can actually be a benefit for anybody who has, has fears or, or discomfort with that. Um, and yeah, in terms of side effects, I had a few questions I think about, um, about um, lumbar punctures and, and recovery and that. I think it can be different from different lumbar punctures. Um, I know multiple participants that have and I mean there's people taking part in trials are getting lumbar punctures every um, month or two months um, so um, just because you had a bad reaction to one lumbar puncture doesn't mean you're more likely to have one the next time and the same goes for if you had a painful lumbar puncture so in my experience they're usually pain free um, and most of our participants were really surprised at the lack of discomfort that they had, but you can get a bit more discomfort if it takes a bit longer to find the right space. Um, and I would say that happens probably one in 10 of the lumbar punctures. Um, but someone who's had multiple lumbar punctures, that it isn't anything to do with that person. It just can, can be um, a bit my dad his first one went really bad and he had really bad side effects um but it got better and then he said the odd one that didn't go great but for the most part um it's gotten better and they've gotten to know him and know like where to go and stuff so from his experience wasn't so great at the beginning but it's gotten better. yeah um i would totally agree and i think having a good relationship as, as Jenna said is building that relationship up um really does help and I think that for people doing multiple lumbar punctures in the same centers there's a benefit there um I'm conscious of time as well um so one of the questions was about getting involved in um patient advisory or HD cope so Jenna could you talk a bit more about how you got involved in that and um yeah so uh 
Initially, my involvement with HD Cope, I discovered that um, the Huntington's Society of Canada, um, the Huntington's uh, Society in the US, and uh, the Huntington Society, Society, Society in um, Europe had uh, come together to form um, a coalition. And I, I found that out just by like reading the regular newsletter that the Huntington Society of Canada produces. And in there, there was a call out for patient, for um, people to get involved. And, you know, it was a simple application process and I just applied. Since then, um, you know, every time like I attend a conference and there's like a new organization there or someone that's talking about something that involves like patients and the patient's voice. And um, I always go to their website and at the top of every every patient organization's website, especially now, because this is becoming such a popular uh, thing, uh, you know, at the top right side of the website um, of most patient organizations, there's like a, you know, who are we or how do we get involved? Um, link that you can click on. And what I'm seeing more and more is um, that they have options for uh, citizens or patients or caregivers to get involved and become part of um, these, uh, these panels. Um, so I think that that's, that's a great way to, to um, find out uh, how to get involved. Um, I've also found many opportunities uh, to get involved in um, patient advocacy um, or even like smaller scale research studies um, through, again, through our patient organization, the Huntington Society of Canada, but through like our closed Facebook groups, um, sometimes things get posted in those. And it, I trust it because I know that it's like, it's uh, um, vetted by um, the Huntington Society of Canada and it's managed by um, uh, an administrator. Uh, so those are good places to find out things. Um, and um, also like all of these pharmaceutical companies that we've heard from today, all of them have um, like, you know, they want patients, especially when it comes to Huntington's disease, they want families and caregivers to share their story, like whether it be um, patient awareness days or, you know, just um, when they're, uh, when they're having uh, conferences or like educational days with their, their uh, like staff internally, they want to know our story and they want to hear it. I mean, they want their clinical trials and studies to be successful. And, and part of that is understanding our story and what it means to live with HD. And so um, I've had lots of friends within the HD cope uh, within our coalition who, you know, when they get word that like, you know, Azavan is developing something or triplets developing something, they'll, reach out to them directly and say, I'm a patient with Huntington's disease, or I'm a caregiver, and I want to share my story with your HD team. So I think um, if that's something you're interested in, you know, like reach out to the organization that you're interested in being a part of and, and try and connect with them that way. Thanks, Sarah. Um, okay, we've got one minute left. And there's a question about what been the most interesting part of being involved in research, either as a participant or researcher. I'm going to ask Heather because you haven't talked that much. Um, and... I know, such a surprise. I haven't talked so much. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll just keep it short and sweet for y'all. But um, the most interesting is that for the researchers that I could find out what was going on at the forefront. So I was involved straight away. I had all the resources around me. Um, and not only that, but my project could lead me to a lot of other projects and I would just learn more. So for me, it was just all about finding out as much as I could and relating that how it would make me feel better or, or how I thought that would help in treatments. And it's just like a really big conversation in research. Like we're all just chatting all the time about, oh, but I've done this and found this out. How could that help you? Um, so I think I found it a really big family, really. It's like the same way that, you know, Nicole said that when she would go in that you're just so comforted because you're surrounded by like-minded people. So for the best part, of, the most interesting part of the research was just finding out the new things when they happened. And I know like reading some of the scientific journals is very daunting and I don't even like doing it. And that's apparently what I should be doing. And um, so I love HD Buzz for this. And I sometimes just go there to get the quick information because it's, you know, it's really mm. understandable straight away. And I don't need to spend time Googling the words that I don't know. So um, I think that's, yeah, that's the most interesting part for me. It's just, it never stops. Like 
I know research can seem slow, but we never stop. And the minute it comes out, like it's just all a flurry and everyone trying to find out as much as they can. Thanks for that. I think we're being picked out. <laughs> so thank everybody who's been listening. Um, I'm sorry if I missed any questions in the chat. Um, but no, I think you did well to get everybody. Um, so thank you guys so much for participating and sharing your experiences. Um, I think you're all heroes for participating, especially in my world. Um, and I think in the chat, you're getting a lot of praise and a lot of thanks for sharing your stories. So kudos to all of you and you're my heroes. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, next for our attendees on the doc is um, going to check out Charles Sabine and his presentation. Um, he's a really great speaker. So if you haven't heard him, I suggest checking that out. Um, if you have any other questions for any of our research panel, you can reach out to HDO and we will get you answers. Um, other than that, thank you for tuning in. Uh, there's a couple sessions left to go and our first Congress is over. So have a great day, enjoy the rest, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Okay.